Our next speaker will be Joseph West. Joseph resides in Tucson, Arizona, where he is doing graduate work in sociology. His research focus is culturally motivated social movement mobilization. He also has research interests in social network analysis and the sociology of science. Please welcome Joseph. Uh, hi. Um, the title of my talk is Authentic Mormonism and Motivation to Action. I'm actually not sure that's a very good title, so maybe we can come up with a... What's that? Okay. Um, so, yeah, maybe by the end of the talk you can help me come up with a better title for it. But... Um, uh, Okay, this is Israel Barlow, who is my great, great, great grandfather, and uh, he um, has over 100,000 living descendants on earth right now. Um, he was the individual who found the land that became Nauvoo, Illinois, and as a result, he has a statue dedicated to him at, that's kitty corner from the Nauvoo Temple. There's also a, a virgin of the statue up at the, this is the place monument. And um, he was a bodyguard of Joseph Smith. It's lots of cool stories to tell my kids about him. He's the source of great amount of honor and pride in our family um, to talk about um, our heritage. Um, this is a, a Eliza Ann Dibble, who's my great, great, great grandmother. Um, she was, um, her father joined the church in 1831, um, took a bullet took a lead ball to the left of the navel in the Mormon Missouri Wars and carried it with him as a little bump on his back the rest of his life. Um, but she, at the age of 15, was uh, the housemaid in the home of this person, Orson Spencer, a very prominent uh, Mormon theologian. And it's a kind of a narrative that's familiar, maybe if we know a little bit about Joseph Smith's history, as young uh, housemaids that are... Um, uh, um, around these men that, you know, are uh, thinking a lot about this new theology and new ways to organize life and feel this great sense of entitlement. And she was assigned um, by her father and Brigham Young to be uh, Orson Spencer's uh, wife at the age of 15. Um, and um, that didn't work out. She was sort of cast out of that family and ended up marrying a few years later my great-great-great-grandfather, and they had a, a happy relationship, luckily for her. Um, not the case for a lot of um, young women in early Mormon history. Um, and so I, I, I share these two sort of uh, vignettes um, because this creates a lot of tension for me personally, and, um, and what I want to argue is that the... Um, the shame and honor slash pride associated with Mormon past is deeply and profoundly consequential in, uh, for Mormons in their orientation to action, both individual and collective action. And um, so the question is, how do we deal with this, with this tension, and how can Mormonism be redeemed in a way that justifies um, its past sins? And so I kind of want to frame this as a paradox um, one of the paradoxes of Mormonism. There's a vast literature um, on paradoxes in Mormonism um, that are explored, and kind of what I want to say is that um, some of these past writings about um, one of the famous uh, sort of like couplets of Joseph Smith is um, when... Uh, I, just, it, I just should have put it in my notes, but when contraries are proven, truth is made manifest. Um, and uh, so, so there's this idea that, you know, Paradoxes are ideas that oppose each other can drive things forward in a way that's beneficial. And um, there's a vast literature of theory and research on how culture motivates action in sociology. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to really go into a lot of that, except to just present a metaphor about how I, I would suggest that um, paradox drives action. Um, and that is the, 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 the metaphor is like paradoxes are like the uh, two ends of a bowstring um, and it's, it's the tension and, and uh, contradiction between those ends that are the condition for either music made from the bow or an arrow shot from that bowstring. Um, and, uh, um, okay, so I want to focus on, I think that the, of the people who have written on paradoxes, Givens' work uh, is more closely related to practice, which is what I'm interested in. Um, 
And so I just want to kind of talk about some of the things that he, that he talked about, the paradoxes in Mormonism that he thinks drives Mormon cultural expression um, are, are some of these. The first three are, I'm not really going to talk about, authority versus radical freedom, searching versus certainty, um, the sacred versus the banal. Uh, and, and then the last one that he does talk, cover a little bit about, which is kind of talking about this shame idea that's important to me in this talk, is election versus exile. Um, could I actually have my water? I could just bring that up. Um, and, uh, thank you. Um, okay, so... Um, I don't know. Really briefly, sorry for all the text, uh, a sociological defi definition of shame defined not in psychological terms of the experience of the individual, but just the red here. Um, there's all these things we can think about as shame, embarrassment, humil humiliation, but then just I'm going to read the red part here. What unites all these cognates is that they involve the feeling of a threat to the social bond. Uh, that is, I use a sociological definition of shame rather than the more common psychological one. So the threat to the social bond is what is driving this experience in individuals of a feeling of shame. And uh, again, that's what I'm saying is deeply consequential for Mormons, given the amb just ambivalence they feel about their past and their heritage. Um, okay, enough of that, enough theory. Um, Let's see, okay, in the face of shame, uh, both in individual interaction and collectively, uh, we have two options, we can assimilate or resist. So, the, so it's, the shame is created by this uh, discrepancy between an expectation and what is uh, experienced. And I put the picture of the Salt Lake Temple because uh, just like a quick story from Mormon history is when the um, armies came in and they were building the Salt Lake Temple, um, in the face of that opposition, what uh, Brigham Young decided to do was to bury the temple and its foundation. And um, that's going to be an important metaphor later, so hang on to that. Um, okay, so there's been two important works that I would say deal with this. Uh, the first is a sociological work on the right, Armand Moss. Uh, the Mormon struggle with assimilation. I think that this was basically the problem that he was dealing with, is how do Mormons respond when they're basically, in their early history, forced to assimilate, and then he argues basically that there's this sort of retrenchment period where we're trying to recover this authentic Mormonism. Um, and uh, he was writing in 1994. Um, this book on the left by Kathleen Flake is what is, in my view, the single most important work to understand sort of like the present state of Mormon identity and how it came to be. This is a book about what happened at the turn of the century when uh, they stopped practicing polygamy. Um, there were these congressional hearings because there was a, a Mormon apostle that was elected as a senator, and there was this question of whether or not he could be if he was a part of a religion that practiced, that did illegal practices. Um, and so, um, let's see, I want to make sure that I'm not getting lost here. Um, Okay, so yeah, so what, uh, what Flake argues is that right at the turn of the century, this major shift in Mormon identity took place and that it entailed a crisis among Mormons um, because the, the things that they had been taught were the, the sort of like source of legitimacy in their religion, which was these alternative practices, these alternative economic and family practices, then were sort of put aside. And not only were they put aside, they were put aside in a very public way. For example, two of the apostles um, sort of refused to bow to this, uh, to, to this uh, um, denial of the practices, and then were basically publicly, there was a sort of like public resignation that was supposed to be proof of the church's uh, acquiescence to these new standards. And so, you know, the um, Joseph F. Smith, who was the president at the time, sort of was forced to... Um, in a sense, put two of his closest associates under the bus and, um, and uh, um, in order to kind of like basically assimilate, okay? Again, in these, when we talk about what the responses to um, shame can be. Um, one other tiny just like story that I think exemplifies so perfectly what this must have felt like, okay? In 1905, they have to find a way, church leadership has to find a way to take the focus off, there's this crisis of legitimacy, and to take the focus off of what was happening in the changes of practices, 
and on to something else that would provide that legitimacy. And what they chose to do, that was the year of 1905 was when they dedicated the uh, Joseph Smith Memorial, I think I have a, here it is, uh, in Vermont at his birth, commemorating the 100-year anniversary of his birth. And uh, I, I, I just love this, that at this dedication, okay, they've traveled across the country um, in 1905, most of the leaders, to participate in this dedication and to make it this new source of legitimacy um, where, so the focus was taken off the practices that, that Joseph Smith set forth and practices which, by the way, were the reason why Brigham Young was able to uh, rise in the succession crisis. It was his embracement of those practices. Um, that um, for, away, okay, so the focus had to be taken away from those practices onto something else, and they chose to, to do it on the first vision, the legitimacy of Joseph Smith, uh, the uniqueness of, you know, continuing revelation. Um, and actually, the idea of continuing revelation is one of the things that Mouse talks about as this retrenchment thing, the things that's now focused on more and more as unique about Mormonism, okay? But that wasn't necessarily always, always the case. By the late 1890s, most members didn't even know about the first vision. It wasn't really a thing that was at the, the basis of the legitimacy of Mormonism until this time when there was this crisis and they had to, sh to shift that to something else. Um, okay, they're at this dedication and uh, the opening hymn is Praise to the Man, okay, which is a hymn about Joseph Smith, um, one of the lines of which the earth must atone for the blood of this man, uh, the blood of that man. Um, there are some other uh, great lines in there that as these men are sitting there thinking about uh, what Joseph Smith meant, you know, and sort of like the pride that they felt in him um, and, the experience, and being there to, at the dedication of this monument to him. And then, uh, and this is right in the wake of, the, of them having to, like I said, kind of like put some of their associates under the bus and um, deny the will of some of the people who wanted to continue those practices. And then, so, so they sing the one, praise to the man, and then the very next song comes on the program, which is the Star Spangled Banner. So just this uh, moment of now we turn around and we honor the government and the very institution that has forced us into this place. Uh, and, the, and, and just imagining the experience of that, um, I think, is, goes a long way. And, and then that carried forward. I mean, uh, Joseph F. Smith's main message from during his whole uh, leadership was about forgiveness and about, and about assimilation, basically, forgiving um, the people on the outside for um, what happened and just kind of like going with it. And I guess what I want to suggest with that is that um, whatever chance there was to redeem what I would characterize as the sins of polygamy um, were lost then because, they, because then it was just repressed. It was just pushed away. It's not mentioned anymore soon after that in any kind of official teachings. And... Um, and maybe if there had been, maybe if there, those practices had been allowed to continue, there would have been internal sort of like maybe feminist mechanisms that would have allowed, that would have generated some way for us to redeem the story, you know, of Eliza Ann Dibble. Um, and, uh, but that didn't happen. It's just repressed further um, uh, into the subconscious. Um, okay, so I'm, uh, is this four minutes total or tell I... Do I want to take any questions or anything? Okay. Okay, I'm almost done. Okay, so... Um, okay, so... Um, so I think that going back to the um, analysis of uh, Armand Moss, I think that one thing... This is published in 1994. I think that he's... Uh, he kind of tells a, a, a pretty redeeming story about retrenchment being this return to authenticity. And I think that in 1994, there were two things missing from that analysis. One was this uh, book by Flake, and the other was um, basically 20 years, in the 20 years since then, of declining growth rates, especially in, um, among educated industrial um, countries. And so, um, and so I think that what he describes as one of the major, like, uh, uh, things that happen with retrenchment, which is this focus on um, uh, 
the prophet, continuing revelation, having a prophet on the earth is a sort of like unique thing that allows us to draw symbolic boundaries and create a feeling of us within uh, Mormonism. I actually think that given the analysis of Flake that all that really is is just a continuation of the assimilation that began with Joseph F. Smith because that's when the shift went from these hardcore practices that went against so much of the very nature of American cultural values. Two things there. One is uh, monogamy, and two is uh, capitalist economic practices, both of which Joseph Smith did not just say, oh, it's okay if we practice something alternative to those things. He completely turned those things on its head and said, not only is it okay to, to think about alternative family arrangements, but actually the way that I want to institute it is the most righteous way to do it and the only way that we can organize a celestial order, the celestial kingdom. Same with the economic practices. Um, and so... Um, so, so basically, I think that there is a possibility for retrenchment, as Mouse talks about, as kind of like a return to authenticity, um, but that it has to come in a, in a way that we have yet to see, okay? And uh, so I want to just, um, I don't know, I actually don't wish that I had a more clear answer about how that's supposed to come about, um, but uh, um, I think that going back to what I mentioned about the bearing of the Salt Lake Temple, is that, um, well, actually, no, let me, before I say that, let me read this. Um, oh, there's Joseph F. Smith. I'm not going to, okay. So this is uh, from my quote bank from, uh, I have like a whole folder on my computer of Christopher, quotes I got from Christopher Bradford, but this is just one of them. Um, but uh, this is or Orson F. Whitney writing in the, uh, close to the turn of the century, right around the time of the, um, when uh, polygamy was stopped. Um, Okay, I meant to actually highlight a middle part. Um, I'll just read the whole thing. Um, Many of these people are perhaps preparing themselves by following after the world in its mad race for wealth and pleasure to go down with Babylon when she crumbles and falls. But I know there is a people in the heart's core of this people that will arise in their majesty in a day that is near at hand and push spiritual things to the front a people who will stand up for God, fearing not man nor what man can do, but believing, as the prophet Joseph says, that all things we suffer are for our best good and that God will stand by us forever and ever. So I think that what's kind of happened is that we were forced as a people to bury the foundations of the temple that we were trying to build. And uh, what actually happened when, that, when they, when they uh, dug the, that foundation up to continue, they built, it was built out of found, a sandstone, and, they, and it, the sandstone was actually cracked. And so that's why the temple is now built out of granite, because they had to actually redo the whole foundation. And, um, and I want to suggest that as a powerful metaphor for um, what is happening in movements like the MTA, and not just the MTA, and other movements of this, uh, that are driven by this desire to return to an authentic Mormonism, but, but one that doesn't apologize for, even as it acknowledges you know, some, of the, some of the problematic aspects of Mormon past. Um, so thinking about the burying of the Salt Lake Temple as a metaphor, we're now in a retrenchment period that Mouse describes. Um, we want to remember what was forgotten. This means uncovering the foundation and beginning the work of building the temple once again. But just as Brigham Young found that the sandstone cornerstones were cracked, we too see what was laid then now must be replaced in some way. Um, and uh, I wish I had more specifics to say about exactly how that should happen, but um, those are... My thoughts, that's what I got, thank you.